Hello, everybody, and thanks for th thanks for coming to this uh, to this panel. I, my name is Dan. I'm a principal engineer at Skyscanner. I'm a member of the Open Telemetry Governance Committee and also a member of the End User SIG. And uh, I'm thrilled to be hosting this panel today. And I've got with me uh, a panel of uh, incredibly experienced experts in open telemetry and end users as well. And uh, at Observability Day and KubeCon, um, we speak a lot about how we build platforms and how we build platforms for, for open telemetry. And uh, one of the things we perhaps talk a little bit less about and where I want to, or we want to focus this panel um, is how our, what I call, like to call the end, end users, right? So the end users of those platforms within your companies. How do they get access to, to those APIs, to those SDKs and instrumentation libraries in a way that reduces their cognitive load? So um, we're gonna get, I wanna dive deep into those topics. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to um, mention a couple of housekeeping items. The first one is that we would love to have your input and participation in this panel. And for that purpose, we've put together a board that you can go to if you visit the link and the QR code. And uh, yeah, you can go there, you can add new topics, you can upvote topics as well that you would like to talk about. Uh, we may not be able to cover every single topic that you, that you propose. And that's why after that, we'll transfer the, the topics that we are not able to, to cover to our end user SIG channel in the CNCF Slack. And if you don't have an account in the CNCF Slack, you can use the second QR code there and get an account in there. And yeah, we'll be transferring that, we, the, those questions, we can keep the conversation going. And lastly, please remember that for the questions of the topics that you propose, uh, just keep things civil. <laughs> we, uh, we are still bound by the open telemetry, by the CNCF uh, code of conduct. And uh, let's try to keep the, the topics or the conversation in topic. All right, without further ado, um, let's get to know our panelists first. Would you mind introducing yourselves and what you do? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Vijay Samuel, uh, and uh, I'm the uh, architect for eBay's uh, reliability engineering organization. So anything regarding the observability platform, site reliability engineering, or our NOC, uh, I do architecture for all of them. Uh, I've been uh, pretty active with CNCF's uh, observability tag. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Suman uh, Karmuri. I'm uh, currently a principal engineer at Airbnb. Uh, I'm the tech lead for observability there and look at a bunch of other things around like reliability and uh, all things observability. Uh, in the past, I've worked on, uh, I've been working on observability for a while now. In the past, I've, I was the tech lead for Zipkin. I'm also one of the authors of the open tracing spec. Uh, I've been like a couple of databases along the way. Uh, the latest one being uh, one called Astra. Uh, that is a log search uh, platform. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here and great to talk to everyone here. Hey there, my name is Hazel Weekly. I have a lot of thoughts and they never stop thinking. They never stop thinking. And so I do wear a lot of hats as well. And one of those hats that I'm particularly fond of is I am one of the first fellows of the Nivoli Foundation, which helps try to figure out how to take projects and turn those into communities and take those communities and turn them into ecosystems. And it turns out that that's really hard. Getting people to work together, getting them to collaborate, getting that politics resolved amicably, it's all difficult. Uh, another thing that I do is I'm with the Deaf and Hard of Hearing Working Group, and we actually have some fun stuff at KubeCon as well. So if you want to see our booth that's downstairs, if you want to see us, you can see us in the DEI community room on Thursday. Good after lunch, everybody. Um, I'm Ariel Valentin. I'm a observability engineer at GitHub. I work on the delivery side of it, meaning uh, make sure that data gets from the client instrumented applications out to our backends. Um, I'm also a maintainer of the Ruby contrib packages. So if anybody's interested in talking a little bit about that, you could uh, chat with me in the hallways. Cool. Uh, thank you very much, all. Um, so I, as I introduced the topic, let's start with that topic about reducing cognitive load. Um, our developers and our service owners, they're going to need access to the OTEL API. So my first question is, how do you give access to the OTEL API or to instrumentation libraries while reducing the cognitive load? What are the things that you're 
uh, that you're doing to make it easier for them. Um, um, <clears throat> so 95% of uh, applications that are uh, built on eBay use something called a managed stack. Uh, in most commonly used languages, we ship libraries for our developers. And uh, through that, there is a lot of free instrumentation that's available to them. And also, the SDK is fully bootstrapped uh, through the library itself. So all the developer needs to do is, uh, if they want to implement uh, tracing, they just uh, get the tracer and then start adding uh, span. So we remove some of the complexity, but the general hope is that for uh, every application, they should not have to do any form of instrumentation un unless they really want to. And uh, the reliability engineering group is able to observe the entire uh, fleet uh, as if all applications behaved uh, the same way. Uh, the situation at Airbnb is uh, somewhat similar as well. Uh, I think the best way to actually uh, have people access to open telemetry is uh, the case where they don't actually have to do anything to get it. So what we do at, uh, at Airbnb is most of our open telemetry instrumentation uh, is part of our core framework. So one of the things we could do uh, to make open telemetry easy to use is if you have like a managed service framework stack or something, uh, putting observability at that layer actually helps easier adoption. And also we run hotel collector as a sidecar everywhere, uh, as a sidecar on all the Kubernetes pods and on all the hosts. As a result, uh, any data that is coming in, uh, you can easily collect it just by configuring the collector to your needs. Uh, and uh, the second best way for users to use like hotel collector uh, in addition to uh, putting it inside frameworks is also uh, having uh, standardizing the spec of what your metrics ingestion pipeline supports. So if you can use a metrics ingestion pipeline that is uh, hotel uh, compatible, then uh, it makes adoption of open telemetry easier because even if people emit data in discrete formats, at the end of the day, they have to access that data in, uh, from like a visualization layer and the pipeline uh, also, that's another way for users to uh, get used to open telemetry spec. When I think about reducing the cognitive load, you have to kind of go into the organizational structure of the company and how the teams interact with each other and map that to what makes sense for the teams operating. If you have a single centralization strategy that you tend to use, you're going to really want to lean on things like an open telemetry collector. And you're really going to want to lean on things like auto instrumentation. And that will allow you to centralize a lot of that knowledge. On the other hand, if you distribute things out and you have teams own a lot more, you're going to want to think a lot more about things like how do you have these semantic inventions? And how do you think about making it so that you can do this bottom-up correlation across the company? And they're both important, but you're only going to have time to do one thing at a time. And as a platform team, you're probably going to have time to do negative five things at a time. So you have to pick your strategy and that has to detail with the organization structure first. Uh, I wish I had a lot of great stories to tell you. I could tell you about a lot of things that I'm not good at, uh, but um, one of the biggest challenges that we had uh, was figuring out where we could come to a consensus about something. So, you know, the first thing that we anchored to was semantic conventions. But we're very early adopters of those semantic conventions. What's one of the challenges we run into? They evolved and they changed over time, right? So as you start to see field names change, I don't know about you all, but um, there's new environment variables that are like stability opt-in and this. We're not even close to trying to get there because we're still working on, you know, pre-1.0 semconf. Uh, we started to structure our logs before OTLP structured log formats were available. We started to roll out our tracing libraries and we said, you know what, across the board, very similar to what y'all had done at, at your organizations, is we had sort of the default set of libraries that everyone used around a company and we said, we're going to trust these. These are going to be the minimum set of instrumentation libraries we'll roll out to all teams. And here's a handy little wrapper library that you'll install and it'll, and, it'll, and it'll roll out. Again, because we're adopting this pre-automatic instrumentation or pre-Kubernetes operator 
being available. So, um, you know, it's been quite a journey, but it, it's involved a lot of the, a, a lot of participation from a lot of champions around the org. Uh, because this stuff is very, I'm gonna, from my perspective, my, my end users, when, that, when I talk to them about Oltel, they're like, man, this is super complex. Uh, and it shouldn't be, but it is very complex. Every time we go around and reteach folks, hey, the, the Go instrumentation works like this. You have a wrapper function, find the library. This is what you have to redact. This is where you add your field. Um, so I don't know, that didn't answer the question about how we reduce the cognitive load other than the social aspect of it, yep. which is to find champions and to get everybody to, to coalesce around something. Yeah. My favorite quippy one-liner for that is making change easy to handle rather than easy to do. Yeah. I think I would like to go back actually to what you said, Hazel, and the, um, you know, social like aspect or the organizational structure. And one of the things that we, that we see sometimes is that some teams will be, you know, at the top of their observability game and they want to do things before they're enabled by the platform, right? So then the first ones that they want to like, I don't know, try out profiling or try out something new in open telemetry. How do you avoid being a blocker for those teams? So you're a platform team. How do you avoid being a blocker for them and allow them to experiment? Um, Hazel, if you like to pick that one. How do I avoid one? How do you avoid being a blocker for, for teams that want to adopt new things? Mm -hmm. So avoid being a blocker. At some point, if teams are relying on you, you're always inherently going to be a blocker. So it's really more about how do they perceive that blocking? Is it a conversation that you're collaborating with them on? Or are you a gatekeeper to them doing things? If it's the latter, you're never going to have a productive conversation with them. You're always going to be blocking them. If it's a conversation and you're working with them and you're enabling them, we both understand it's going to take time, but you work through it together. And then you change the framing rather than prevent the stopping, if that makes sense. Yep. Anybody else wants to jump in? Ariel, you? Sure, I wanted to give a chance to the gentleman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Um, uh, invariably what happens is like people who want to be on the bleeding edge, uh, they are the ones who are uh, very malleable to break things. Uh, and we typically try to partner with those kinds of folks so that like we can do fast iterations. And I think uh, identifying the right teams that, that have that, uh, 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 that don't have the resistance to change, uh, I think that's, that's pretty critical in, in those kinds of scenarios. I think uh, for us uh, in the past, like my in my experience, the best way to not be a blocker is to find a way to help them. Uh, most of the time, when people are trying to uh, like try to do something, they're trying to solve a specific problem. Uh, if they are trying to use features that you don't support, uh, it may be better to find a way. Let's say if you can build them, great. If you can't build them, find a way to solve their problem. And most of the times. Uh, it also helps build trust uh, between your team and their team, and also between uh, uh, your technological, your technical abilities and uh, their needs. I'll say in my experience, uh, we handle everything through issues. So somebody opens up an issue, <laughs> and they say, hey, uh, I'm really interested in trying this thing out. And what we'll do is we have our office hours. So we have regular um, office hours that we have folks come and ask questions. Uh, we'll look at, let's say, you know, some portion of your time for you to be, as an engineer on my team, to be a consultant for that other team that wants to run this experiment. So most recently, there's been a group that's been very interested in profiling, and that's the performance engineering team. Who am I to tell the performance engineering team not to investigate tooling that would help them? Uh, what we want to do is try to figure out a way so that we can streamline the process and they could repeat it so that we could roll that out to other teams. So we start with issues, we start with um, short meetings, and then we act like consultants and we do regular check-ins with them. Um, and where we can add capacity, we do. So I'll pair it with folks over Zoom. We'll sit down, we'll open a VS Code. Let's crank through some of this stuff. I wanna add a tiny bit of flavor onto that, which is I often find platform teams running into the problem of you have this ticket workflow, you have this collaboration with teams, but you treat every team as equal, and every problem is equal, and every employee is equal, which means everything 
is important, and you lose the ability to actually understand your customer by trying to please everybody and make them happy. And then yeah. so it's so easy to run into, I have a to-do list of 500 items, and it turns out 450 of them, nobody actually is going to use that. Well, if they do use the thing, it's 10 people, and you've got you know, a couple hundred other people who have this other problem, and you really have to understand your customer if you're gonna build something for them. But that doesn't mean listening to them when they talk out loud, necessarily. You have to actually work larger to find the group of people that are also not talking. Thank you. And I think every one of your organizations has been adopting Hotel really successfully. Um, I want to know what is better now for your teams now that you have adopted Hotel. Maybe you can tell us of a major win or maybe something that I don't know, that is a bit niche and that you implemented a solution that you could only do thanks to open telemetry. Um, who would like to go first? <laughs> Ariel, maybe you were, you were nodding. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's like, I want to be careful. I don't want the, my end users to get mad at me right now. That's okay, <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> no, but it's like, uh, uh, oftentimes what happens is that GitHub evolves all of the time. And so we're heavily, heavy users of feature flags. Um, and we're heavy users of uh, short rollouts and we dog food almost everything that uh, we make public. So it'll hit us first on our Canary cluster, some feature that has limited release out to us. And our teams uh, prior to this would have all of their own sort of workflows to try to figure out uh, what's going on. And, and since we've moved from open tracing to OTEL, they were able to identify a lot of problems before they actually reached all of y'all. So, um, you know, one of the more interesting things about these distributed systems is all of the calls that would be made to remote services. We found places where it's like, oh, if you render the issues page, it would have done, you know, 2000 um, authorization calls for some reason um, and beating those to the punch. So I think that uh, that's one big win for us. And certainly for our privacy team, they're so much happier that we've adopted a standard structure for all of our data because, uh, you know, PII, handling PII is very important to us. We don't, uh, have, we don't ship it out to any of our backend systems. So everything gets scrubbed ahead of time before it gets sent out. We can do that through our uh, internal um, uh, open telemetry collector pipeline. Um, and so that's a big part of... Uh, what's been very successful for us, something that would have been really hard to do or we had to distribute to all of the clients for them to try to handle, so. Uh, yeah, um, so for us, we were a statsd shop and we going to Otel helped in a couple of ways. Uh, first thing it helped is going from statsd to Otel showed like a reduction in the amount of resources because Instead of like, let's say you're incrementing a counter, doing that on a sidecar and incrementing the CPU, uh, doing a, do, incrementing the uh, counter on a sidecar was much more expensive compared to just incrementing an in-memory counter. So there were like resource uh, utilization benefits from going from statsd based systems to hotel based systems. The other advantage of uh, hotel for us is instead of like currently we had like three libraries, one for metrics, one for traces, and one for logs. Uh, and uh, going to hotel at least helped us consolidate uh, the tracing use cases with the metrics use cases. So we could just use one library, which also means uh, we don't have to maintain multiple libraries or multiple forks uh, of the same system. And uh, thirdly, the advantage of hotel for us is uh, given that it's a standard format, uh, and it's open source, we could actually use open source sidecars and collectors uh, to collect all the data. And uh, because it's open source, we were also able to contribute back fixes and uh, performance improvements back to the stack. And this was uh, very good for us because previously we were maintaining sidecars that were in-house and we didn't want to maintain those uh, going forward. And uh, finally, the advantage of Hotel was it actually unlocked a lot of use cases for us that were very hard for us to onboard. Previously, our in-house instrumentation uh, was, uh, our in-house tracing was on in-house implementation, which made taking advantage of like newer services uh, extremely hard. For example, uh, we were using LLMs and LLMs used tracing, but that tracing was open telemetry based and we couldn't take those traces and put them in our existing tracing system. But by moving to hotel, uh, we were able to use the same hotel-based ingestion pipeline, both for our custom uh, 
uh, traces as well as the open source traces. It helped us adopt open source systems, especially in the AI space, uh, very easily compared to the existing uh, system we had before. One of my favorite things to do with Otel that's been very successful is to really challenge people's notions of what it's for and how to use it. So as an example, at a previous company I worked at, one of the most successful uses of it was putting inside all of the headers of the actual request that the end user got a link to the trace so that whenever you saw anything, you could just open it up and get the direct link there. Or if you had a test suite, you can put the link to the actual results of the test suite in your actual application. You can embed weird things like, for example, all of our database queries actually had a explain database query service. And we would just stick that link to the service in the trace for any of the database queries. So you never had to look up anything. It's this ability to tie all of your systems together from all of your different parts of the business in a way that actually makes it sensible for people and then you get excited about it because they can talk to non-engineers in the company and have a productive conversation about what is actually useful for the business. And I mean, you can also do tracing, I guess. Um, <clears throat> a big uh, use case that uh, we are trying real hard to get to is uh, true end-to-end -end observability. Uh, so how the interaction started from a browser uh, into our gateways, into our data centers, which applications it went, uh, talked to, and how things behaved. Um, <clears throat> until open telemetry came about, like it would have been really hard to do that because like you have to use different libraries, uh, different conventions, and whatnot. And uh, with open telemetry now, you have a JavaScript library, you have one for Swift, Kotlin, you have uh, for all the RUM style use cases and for all the server side, you have Java, Go, Rust, and whatnot. And uh, the, the, the schemas are also fairly standardized to the point where we are really close to actually hitting it uh, completely. And this is truly powerful because like, for, a, for a company like ours where we have thousands of applications that talk to each other to serve uh, things that the end user sees, uh, having this is really handy when it comes to uh, triaging actual issues. Uh, and the other important part is like uh, uh, coverage, like every uh, third party application or open source application as they keep instrumenting, uh, we get to use it uh, out of the box. And I think it's very uh, useful. Uh, so that being saying, like uh, show of hands, like how many folks have contributed to open telemetry here, uh, whether it be an issue, a bug, uh, PRs, like I think like it's uh, everyone, please give a round of applause for uh, all the contributors out here. Like, it's a it's a big deal. Like, uh, how much uh, it actually simplifies uh, observability in the grander scheme of things, and I think it's something to really be proud about. Thank you very much. Okay, I think we may only have time for one more topic. Uh, so, if you're following the the board, you will see that I'm trying to put topics together. So, the next one is like two combined, two combined topics in here. Uh, the first one is telemetry can be expensive. Um, cost is a factor. Uh, so, but at the same time, um, when you get quality telemetry, it normally ends up being cheaper than, than bad telemetry, right? So uh, there's a combined question here, like how do you ensure that the return on investment is good for, for, your, for your observability data? And how do you ensure that those anti-patterns of bad telemetry don't proliferate in your in your organizations? Sure. Um, we do a few things. Uh, from, a, uh, from a hygiene perspective, uh, we have uh, rate limits in place. Uh, so being, being a pseudo vendor, I, as I like to call it, uh, inside the company, we pro every development team is a tenant for us. And every development team has its own quotas that they need to abide to. And if they breach their quota in either cardinality or throughput, uh, we cut them off. Uh, then it promotes a dialogue of, okay, you shouldn't be doing that, or maybe you should be doing something else. Uh, that's the first line of defense. Uh, beyond that, uh, we do things like uh, head sampling uh, in case of traces uh, for uh, a system that's uh, as high transaction oriented as eBay. 2% uh, is plenty uh, to the point where we do further tail sampling after that to cut cost even uh, further. 
uh, and finally we do uh, a lot of uh, pre aggregations where uh, if someone comes and tells me that uh, container id as a as a as a label matters a lot to them um, it's very easy to convince them otherwise uh, so we pre aggregate a lot of things that are uh, not useful and that uh, cuts down things uh, even further um, to the point where we are fairly happy with the kind of usage that we have. So for us, uh, on the quality side, we don't ensure strict quality standards per se, because uh, one man's trash is another man's treasure. So <laughs> it's kind of really hard to know what's good and what's bad. So what we actually do uh, is uh, we look at three things, basically. We look at how much uh, the performance overhead is of our instrumentation very closely. And that gives us, as a percentage of like CPU utilization, that gives us uh, one uh, vector to tell people, hey, like you're using so much uh, CPU or like memory or whatever resources you are, just emitting metrics. Like, are you sure you're using all of this data? And most of the time, uh, it's a very good motivator for the team because they are generally sensitive about how much it costs, how much these metrics cost, and how much their application costs to run. And this generally uh, works as a good way. Uh, the other place, uh, the other thing we do is we also have per service quotas for our logs, metrics, and traces. And every time a team comes to us and says that, hey, like I'm emptying more metrics and traces, can you please give us more resources or like more quotas on the back end? That's a good time, that's another good time to start a conversation around hey, like, uh, you're using so much data, why don't you just go back and revisit to see if you're using all of this. If you are actually using all of these data, great, we'll, uh, we'll increase the quotas, but uh, if not, this is a good time to revisit like what data is useful and what's not. And uh, the third part uh, we also do is we also obviously like look at the usage information and drop the data that's not being used. Uh, and uh, one more pro tip we actually give developers is often, most of the time telemetry is always added but never removed. So one of the things we actually tell our developers is, hey, like when you're doing a new change, uh, usually you want to monitor it closely to understand how it's behaving and like there you have like a high metric cardinality or things like that. But once the feature is mature and it's been running in production for a little bit, you don't need that level of granularity or that level of insight anymore. So usually when that happens, what uh, a good pro tip we give our developers is, hey, like, you know what, just go add a to-do to your code to just remove it after, let's say, two months or something, or six months after this feature is released. Mm -hmm. And that way, uh, you have something in your code to tell you that, hey, like, this is not needed anymore, and it's easy to identify and remove. So those are like a few things we do. All right, how do we ensure we have good ROI? This is audience participation time. Do you want the funny story, the practical answer, or the theoretical mathematical answer? Raise your hand. Awesome, funny story it is. Cool, so the funny story was, I was at a company previously and they had tasked me with reducing the cost of their observability bill because they had it roughly paid at about 100,000 and they were on track to spend over 350. And that wasn't quite what they wanted and they didn't plan for that. And of course, they also couldn't quite afford it either. And so I dug into their observability and dug into the analytics of it and how everything was working, and I discovered uh, two things fairly immediately. The first was that in the entire company, they were averaging about 200 page views a month. The second was that they also had a really big problem of none of their sampling was actually working. And so I dug through everything, found a weird one line change in the open telemetry collector config. And there's actually a chart out there of 350 million plus up and up and up events per day, boom, less than 3 million a day. And so that actually dropped them from the enterprise tier into almost the free tier of the usage. And so I actually posted that on the internet with a giant arrow that said, sample me harder, mommy. And so that was really, really interesting to dig through and find out why. Of course, going from that, some engineers would later say, oh, I couldn't find this one trace because I was now actually sampling things. And so to that answer, I was like, I'm not going to give you every trace in the universe. You need to actually understand your application in order to figure out what all the similar types of traces are. 
You can't just lump everything in one bucket and then not sample it. You have to actually use this as a way to check that you are understanding your application better over time. So sampling is a cost-effective thing, but also it's a way to double-check your work of how well are you actually understanding things. Oh, did you want me to, I didn't know if you were saying for me to stop. Well, uh, I'm looking for tips, actually, uh, myself. Um, I don't know about y'all, but, you know, okay, logs is fine because, you know, logs come from a source. You know where they come from. Metrics, they come from a source. You know where they come from. You know, you know we have a thing called the resource economy, which is essentially a report uh, that's generated by someone that looks at where all the spend is down to the CPU of the container that's deployed somewhere. Uh, but you know what's really hard to do with that? Traces. Because... Uh, just because one app is emitting some set of traces, there's some set of spans, look at another app and it's doing, you know, uh, tenfold those number of spans, who do you bill that to? Especially when that trace is the thing that's interesting and the thing that got sampled. So that's something that we're struggling with trying to figure out how to do a, a chargeback model for traces. Um, I think right now, there's other things that I would, would like to get into, so I'm going to pause it right there. <laughs> Just if anybody has a solution, come my way. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, as I always say, you, you, own your, you own your spans, you don't own your traces, right? Yeah. So it's difficult to, to do that. Okay, so we're closing in on time, and um, I just wanted to, to finish asking you about your, what you're looking forward to the most in OpenTelemetry, any new things that are coming up and that you're really looking forward to, to adopt, to adopt in, in your organization. Can I start? Uh, yeah, I think uh, on the open uh, telemetry front, two things I'm looking forward to are like, uh, the, uh, we find that the open telemetry agent and uh, the instrumentation uh, is pretty resource heavy and resource intensive. One of the things I'm looking forward to is like all the patches and like work that needs to go in to make those uh, libraries pretty lean and very resource efficient. Uh, the second one I'm looking forward to in the open telemetry space is uh, the building the aggregation pipelines using the open telemetry agent right now. Uh, I would not uh, say is the best of the breed. So uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to all the improvements in that area to make uh, building telemetry collection pipelines and aggregation pipelines really easy with hotel collector itself instead of using an additional binary or something. One of the things I'm looking forward to is actually a thing that nobody's working on yet. So you should get on it. But what we're doing currently is observability is essentially a GigaChat scale JSON lots parser with a fancy search engine. And I'm looking forward to us breaking outside of the tiny little bubble that we call tech and taking the entire rest of the company and figuring out how to find that business value for them and explain the context of the company to the company at the language of the company. And when we figure out how to do that and take all of the data and understanding of our systems and tie it into the whole rest of the company in a way that they can understand it, they'll be able to give us information in a way that lets us build things better for them. And that's what I'm looking forward to. But we should get started on it. And the thing I'm looking forward to the most is profiling. So I hope that we can, at, at GitHub, contribute back to the community so that we can get that moving along. Thank you, everyone, for all of your effort. Um, I agree with profiling. Uh, we're looking forward to that. Uh, with regards to RUM, uh, some improvements in uh, uh, the binary si uh, artifact sizes for the JavaScript library, that would be really great. Uh, but outside of that, coverage, like everyone who owns a community or a product, like instrument with open telemetry, allow it to be exported. So that way, more information can fall in place for us to have uh, standardized uh, observability across the fleet. Uh, that's that's the best thing. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as I said, this is all the time we've got for the topics today. We can continue the conversation in the hotel sec and user uh, Slack channel on CNCF. But let me uh, give a round of applause to our panelists and thank you very much for coming. Thank you.